Hello, and welcome to Shakespeare 2020 LA. Shakespeare 2020 LA is the Los Angeles division of the Shakespeare Project 2020, a worldwide challenge created by Ian Desher to read the entire Shakespeare canon in 2020. Shakespeare 2020 is comprised of Los Angeles professional actors. Um, and today our reading is The Merchant of Venice. And our players are Jason Rennie, Martin Hillier, Taylor Marr, Sasha Venn, Megan Wells, Ron Dorn, Chris Klein, Edgar Landa, J.D. Mata, Vincent Eclavea, Leilani Toon, Ariel McIntyre, and I'm Mary Kerrig. The quality of mercy is not strained, easier said than done. When we suffer systemic injury and long-standing wounds, the petition to mercy goes hard. The law is protection for the citizens and we recognize Lady Justice, a blindfolded woman carrying a sword and a set of scales. It's the common symbol at courthouses in America and inside some courtrooms we see her. She symbolizes fair and equal administration of the law without corruption favor, greed, or prejudice. Lady Liberty's blindfold sets aside Shylock's long-suffering prejudice. It swings both ways, of course, his hatred for Antonio for being a Christian. Portia lives in a bit of a velvet prison, and one wonders if, with her wealth and status, does she really have any practical experience of having to enact the mercy that she attempts to inspire in Shylock. English society in, in the Elizabethan and Jacobian era have been described as Judophobic. English Jews had been expelled under Edward I in 1290 and they were not permitted to return until 1656 after the rule of Oliver Cromwell. Poet John Donne, who was the Dean of St. Paul's Cathedral and a contemporary of Shakespeare, gave a sermon in 1624 perpetuating the blood libel. The entirety unsubstantiated anti-Semitic lie that Jews ritualistically murdered Christians to drink their blood and achieve salvation. In Venice and in some other places, Jews were required to wear a red hat at all times in public to make sure that they were easily identified and they had to live in a ghetto. Fast forward to the Holocaust. Shakespeare's play may have seen, uh, been seen as a continuation of this tradition. The title page of the Quarto indicates that the play was sometimes known as the Jew of Venice in its day, which suggests that it has seen similar similarities to the work of Marlowe's in the 1590s of the Jew of Malta. Regardless of what Shakespeare's authoritative intent might have been, the play has been made use of use by anti-Semites throughout world history. We know that the Nazis used Shylock and the notion of Shylock for their propaganda. And shortly after Kristallnacht in 1938, the Merchant of Venice was broadcast as propaganda over German airwaves. The depiction of Jews in literature throughout centuries bears the close imprint of Shylock. With slight variations, much of English literature up until the 20th century depicts the Jew as a moneyed, cruel, lecherous, avarice, outsider, tolerated only because of his golden hoard. You can see why it might be a tough pill for him to swallow when Portia talks about mercy. But in the end, with its concept of mercy, justice, and divine love, which we are encouraged to hold as examples to obtain. What must I do and how must I act? Are the reasons that Shakespeare's plays are debated and they're new each time that we visit them. Thanks for tuning in today. Sit back and relax and perhaps even read along with us for William Shakespeare's The Merchant of Venice. Act 
Act One, Scene One. A street in Venice. Enter Antonio, Salarino, and Solanio. In sooth, I know not why I am so sad. It wearies me. You say it wearies you. But how I caught it, found it, or came by it, what stuff tis made of, where it is born, I am to learn. And such a want which sadness makes of me that I have much ado to know myself. Your mind is tossing on the ocean. There wear your argosies with portly sail, like signors and rich burghers on the flood, or as it were, the pageants of the sea, do overpeer the petty traffickers that curtsy to them, do them reverence as they fly by them with their woven wings. Believe me, sir, had I such venture forth, the better part of my affections would be with my hopes abroad. I should be still, plucking the grass to know where sits the wind, peering in maps for ports and piers and roads, and every object that might make me fear. Misfortunes to my ventures out of doubt would make me sad. My wind cooling my broth would blow me to an ague when I thought what harm a wind too great might do at sea. I should not see the sandy hourglass run, but I should think of shallows and of flats, and see my wealthy Andrew docked in sand, bailing her high top lower than her ribs to kiss her burial. Should I go to church and see the holy edifice of stone, and not bethink me straight of dangerous rocks, which, touching but my gentle vessel's side, would scatter all her spices on the stream, enrobe the roaring waters with my silks, and in a word but even now worth this, and now worth nothing, shall I have the thought to think on this, and shall I lack the thought that such a thing behanced would make me sad? But tell not me, I know Antonio is sad to think upon his merchandise. Believe me, uh, no, I thank my fortune for it. My ventures are not in one bottom trusted, nor to one place, nor is my whole estate upon the fortune of this present year. Therefore, my merchandise makes me not sad. Why, then you are in love. Fie, <laughs> fie. Not in love neither. Then let us say you are sad, because you are not merry, and twere as easy for you to laugh and leap, and say you are merry, because you are not sad. Now by two-headed Janus, nature hath framed strange fellows in her time, some that will evermore peep through their eyes, and laugh like parrots at bagpiper, and other of such vinegar aspect, that they'll show not show their teeth in a way of smile, though Nestor swear the jest be laughable. Here comes Bassanio, your most noble kinsman, <clears throat> Graciano and Lorenzo. Fare you well. We leave you now with better company. I would have stayed till I had made you marry if worthier friends had not prevented me. Your worth is very dear in my regard. I take it your own business calls on you, and you embrace the occasion to depart. <laughs> good morrow, my good lords. Good signors both. When shall we laugh? Say when. You grow exceeding strange. Must it be so? Uh, we'll make our leisures to attend on yours. My Lord Bassanio, since you have found Antonio, we too will leave you. But at dinner time, I pray you have in mind where we must meet. I will not fail you. You look not well, Signor Antonio. You have too much respect upon the world. They lose it that do buy it with much care. Believe me, you are marvelously changed. I hold the world but as the world, Graciano, a stage where every man must play a part, and mine a sad one. Then let me play the fool. With mirth and laughter let old wrinkles come, and let thy liver rather heat with wine than my heart cool with mortifying groans. <laughs> Why should a man whose blood is warm within sit like his grandsire, cut in alabaster, sleep when he wakes, <laughs> and creep into the jaundice by being peevish? I tell thee what, Antonio, I love thee, and tis my love that speaks. There are a sort of men whose visages do cream and mantle like a standing pond, and do a willful stillness entertained with purpose to be dressed in an opinion of wisdom, gravity, profound conceit, as who should say, I am Sir Oracle, and when I open my lips, let no dog bark. <laughs> Antonio, 
I do know of these that therefore only are reputed wise for saying nothing, <laughs> when I am very sure if they should speak, would almost damn those ears which hearing them would call their brothers fools. I'll tell thee more of this another time, but fish not with this melancholy bait for this fool gudgeon, this opinion. <laughs> C come, good Lorenzo, uh, fare you well a while. I'll end my exhortation after dinner. <laughs> well, we will leave you then till dinner time. I must be one of these same dumb wise men, for Graciano never lets me speak. <laughs> well, keep me company, but two years more, thou shalt not know the sound of thine own tongue. Fare you well, I'll grow a talker for this gear. Ah, thanks, a faith, for silence is only commendable in a neat's tongue dried and a maid not offendable. <laughs> is that anything now? Yeah. Graziano speaks an infinite deal of nothing, more than any man in all Venice. His reasons are as two grains of wheat hid in two bushels of chaff. You shall seek all day ere you find them, and when you have them, they are not worth the search. Well... Tell me now what lady is the same to whom you swore a secret pilgrimage that you today promised to tell me of. <clears throat> it is not unknown to you, Antonio, how much I have disabled mine estate by something showing a more swelling port than my faint means would grant continuance. Nor do I now make moan to be abridged from such a noble rate. But my chief care is to come fairly off from the great debts where in my time something too prodigal hath left me gauged. To you, Antonio, I owe the most in money and in love, and from your love I have a warranty to unburden all my plots and purposes how to get clear of all the debts I owe. I pray you, good Bassanio, let me know it, and if it stand, as you yourself still do, within the eye of honor, be assured, my purse, my person, my extremist means lie all unlocked to your occasion. In my school days, when I had lost one shaft, I shot his fellow of the self-same flight that the self-same way with more advised watch to find the other fourth. And by adventuring both, I oft found both. I urge this childhood proof because what follows is pure innocence. I owe you much, and like a willful youth, that which I owe is lost. But if you please to shoot another arrow that self way, which you did shoot the first, I do not doubt, as I will watch the aim or to find both or bring your ladder hazard back again and thankfully rest debtor for the first. You know me well, and herein spend but time to wind about my love with circumstance, and out of doubt you do me now more wrong in making question of my uttermost than if you had made waste of all I have. Then do but say to me what I should do, that in your knowledge may be me be done, and I am pressed unto it, therefore speak. In Belmont is a lady richly left, and she is fair, and fairer than that word, of wondrous virtues. Sometimes from her eyes I did receive fair, speechless messages. Her name is Portia, nothing undervalued to Cato's daughter, Brutus's Portia, nor is the wide world ignorant of her worth, for the four winds blow in from every coast, renowned suitors, and her sunny locks hang on her temples like a golden fleece, which makes her seat of Belmont's colchus as strong, and many Jasons come in her come in quest of her. Oh, my Antonio, had I but the means to hold a rival place with one of them, I have a mind presages me such thrift that I should questionless be fortunate. Thou knowest that all my fortunes are at sea, neither have I money nor commodity to raise a present sum. Therefore go forth. Try what my credit can do in Venice do. Thou shalt be racked even to the uttermost to furnish thee to Belmont to fair Portia. Go presently inquire, and so will I, where money is, and I no question make to have it of my trust or for my sake. Act 1, Scene 2. Belmont. Enter Portia with her waiting woman, Nerissa. My troth, Nerissa, my little body is a-weary of this great world. You would be, sweet madam, if your miseries were in the same abundance as your good fortunes are. And yet, for aught I see, they are as sick as that surfeit with too much as they that starve with nothing. It is no mean happiness, therefore, to be seated in the mean. 
Superfluity comes sooner by white hairs, but competency lives longer. Good sentences and well pronounced. They would be better if well followed. If to do were as easy as to know, what were good to do? Chapels had been churches and poor man's cottages, princes' palaces. It is a good divine that follows his own instructions. I can easier teach 20 what were good to be done than to be one of the 20 to follow mine own teaching. The brain may devise laws for the blood, but a hot temper leaps over the cold decree. Such a hair is madness. The youth to skip over the meshes of good counsel, the cripple. But this reasoning is not in the fashion to choose me a husband. Oh, me, the word choose. I may neither choose who I would nor refuse who I dislike. So is the will of a living daughter curbed by the will of a dead father. Is it not hard, Nerissa, that I cannot choose one nor refuse none? Your father was ever virtuous and holy men at their death have good inspirations. Therefore, the lottery that he hath devised in these three chests of gold, silver, and lead, whereof who chooses his meaning chooses you, will no doubt never be chosen by any rightly but the one you shall rightly love. But what warmth is there in your affection toward any of these princely suitors that are already come? I pray thee, overname them, and as thou namest them, I will describe them, and according to my description, love led my affection. Well, first there is the Neapolitan prince. Aye, that's a cult indeed, for he doth nothing but talk of his own horse. And he makes <laughs> it a great appropriation to his own good parts that he can shoe himself. <laughs> I am much afeard, my lady, his mother played false with a smith. Then there is the county palatine. He doth nothing but frown, as who would say, and you will not have me choose. He hears merry tales and smiles not. I fear he will prove the weeping philosopher when he grows old, being so full of unmannerly sadness in his youth. I had rather be married to a death's head with a bone in his mouth than either of these. God defend me of these two. How say you by the French Lord, Monsieur Le Bon? God made him and therefore let him pass for a man. In truth, I know it is a sin to be a mocker, but he, why, he hath a horse better than the Neapolitans, a better bad habit than the frowning man, the Count Palatine. He is every man in no man. If a throstle sings, he falls straight a capri. He will fence with his own shadow. If I should marry him, I should marry 20 husbands. If he would despise me, I would forgive him. For if he love me to madness, I shall never requite him. Well, what say you then to Falconbridge, the young baron of England? No, I say nothing to him, for he understands not me, nor I him. He hath neither Latin, French, nor Italian, and you will come into the court and swear that I have a poor pennyworth in the English. He is a proper man's picture. But alas, who can converse with a dumb show? How oddly he is suited. I think he bought his doublet in Italy, his round horse in France, his bonnet in Germany, and his behavior everywhere. Well, what think you of the Scottish lord, his neighbor? That he hath a neighborly charity in him, for he borrowed a box of the ear of the Englishman and swore he would pay him against when he was able. I think the Frenchman became his surety and sealed under for another. Well, how like you the young German, the Duke of Saxony's nephew? <laughs> Very vilely in the morning when he is sober and most vilely in the afternoon when he is drunk. When he is best, he is a little worse than a man. And when he is worse, he's a little better than a beast. And the worst fellow that ever fell 
I hope I shall make shift to go without him. If he should offer to choose and choose the right casket, you should refuse to perform your father's will if you should refuse to accept him. Therefore, for the fear of the worse, I pray thee, set a deep glass glass of Rhenish wine on the contrary casket. For if the devil be within and that temptation without, I know he will choose it. <laughs> I will do anything, Nerissa, ere I will be married to a sponge. You need not fear, lady, the having of any of these lords. They have acquainted me with their determinations, which is indeed to return to their home and to trouble you with no more suit, unless you may be won by any other sort than your father's imposition, depending on the caskets. If I live to be as old as Sibula, I will die as chaste as Diana, unless I be obtained by the manner of my father's will. I am glad this parcel of wooers are so reasonable, for there is not one among them, but I dote on his very absence, and I pray God grant them a fair departure. Do you not remember, lady, in your father's time, a Venetian, a scholar and a soldier that came hither in company of the Marquis of Montferrat? Yes, yes, it was Bassanio. Mm -hmm. As I think, so was he called. True, madam. He, of all the men that ever my foolish eyes looked upon, was the best deserving of a fair lady. I remember him well, and I remember him worthy of thy praise. How now? What news? Uh, the four strangers seek for you, madam, to take their leave. And there is a forerunner come from a fifth, the Prince of Morocco, who brings word the prince's master will be here tonight. If I could bid the fifth welcome with so good heart as I do bid the other four farewell, I should be glad of his approach. If he have the condition of a saint and the complexion of a devil, I had rather he should shrive me than wive me. Come, Nerissa. Sirrah, go before whilst we shut the gate upon one wooer. Another knocks at the door. Act 1, Scene 3. A Street in Venice. Enter Bassanio with Shylock, the Jew. Three thousand ducats, well. Aye, sir, for three months. For three months, well. For the which, as I told you, Antonio shall be bound. Antonio shall become bound, well. May you stead me? Will you pleasure me? Shall I know your answer? 3,000 ducats for three months, and Antonio bound. Your answer to that? Antonio is a good man. Ha have you heard any imputation to the contrary? Oh, no, 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 no. Uh, my meaning in saying he is a good man is, is to have you understand me that he is sufficient. Yet his means are in uh, supposition. He hath an argosy bound to Tripolis, another to the... Indies. I understand, moreover, upon the Rialto, he hath a third at Mexico, a fourth for England, and other ventures he hath squandered abroad. But ships are but boards, sailors but men, there be land rats and water rats, water thieves and land thieves, I mean pirates, and then there is the peril of the waters, winds and rocks. The man is notwithstanding sufficient. 3,000 ducats, I may take his bond. Be assured you may. I will be assured I may. And that I may be assured, I will bethink me. May I speak with Antonio? If it please you to dine with us. Yes, to smell pork, to eat of the habitation which your prophet the Nazarite conjured the devil into. Hmm? I will buy with you, sell with you, talk with you, walk with you, and so following, but I will not eat with you, drink with you, nor pray with you. What news on the Rialto? Who is he comes here? This is Signor Antonio. How like a fawning publican he looks. I hate him for he is a Christian, but more for that in low simplicity, he lends out money gratis and brings down the rate of usance here with us in Venice. 
If I can catch him once upon the hip, I will feed fat the ancient grudge I bear him. He hates our sacred nation, and he rails, even there where merchants do congregate, on me, my bargains, and my well-won thrift, which he calls interest. Cursed be my tribe if I forgive him. Well, Shylock, do you hear? I am debating of my present store, and by the near guess of my memory, I cannot instantly raise up the gross of full 3,000 ducats. What of that? Tubal, a wealthy Hebrew of my tribe, will furnish me. Uh, but soft, how many months do you desire? Arrest you, fair good signor. Your worship was the last man in our mouths. Shylock, albeit I neither lend nor borrow by taking nor by giving up excess. Yet to supply the ripe wants of my friend, I'll break a custom. Is he yet possessed how much you would? Aye, aye, 3,000 ducats. And for three months. Ah, I had forgot, three months. You told me so. Well then, your bond. And let me see. But hear me. Methought you said you neither lend nor borrow upon advantage. I do never use it. When Jacob grazed his uncle Laban's sheep, this Jacob from our holy Abraham, as his wise mother wrought in his behalf, the third possessor, I, he was the third. And what of him? Did he take interest? No, not take interest, not as you would say, directly interest. Mark what Jacob did. When Laban and himself, if were compromised, that all the eanlings which were streaked and pied should fall as Jacob's hire, the ewes being rank in the end of autumn, turn it to the rams. And when the work of generation was between these woolly breeders in the act, the skillful shepherd pill me certain ones, and in the doing of the deed of kind, he stuck them up before the fulsome ewes, who then conceiving did in eaning time four party coloured lambs, and those were Jacob's. This was a way to thrive, and he was blessed, and thrift is blessing if men steal not. This was a venture, sir, that Jacob served for a thing not in his power to bring to pass, but swayed and fashioned by the hand of heaven. Was this inserted to make interest good, or is your gold and silver used in rams? I cannot tell. I make it breed as fast, but note me, senor. Mark you this, Bassanio. The devil can cite scripture for his purpose. An evil soul producing holy witness is like a villain with a smiling cheek. A goodly apple rotten at the heart. Oh, what a goodly outside false of had. Oh. 3,000 ducats, tis a good round sum. Three months from 12, then let me see the rate. Well, Shylock, shall we be beholding to you? Signor Antonio, many a time and oft in the Rialto, you have rated me about my monies and my usances. Still have I borne it with a patient shrug, for sufferance is the badge of all our tribe. You call me misbeliever, cutthroat dog, and spet upon my Jewish gabardine, and all for use of that which is mine own. Well then, it now appears you need my help. Go to then. You come to me and you say, Shylock, we would have monies. You say so. You that did void your room upon my beard, and foot me as you spurn a stranger cur over your threshold. Monies is your suit. What should I say to you? Should I not say, hath a dog money? Is it possible a cur can lend 3,000 ducats? Or shall I bend low and in a bondman's key with bated breath and whispering humbleness say this, oh fair sir, you spat on me on Wednesday last. You spurned me such a day. Another time you called me dog and for these courtesies, I'll lend you this much monies. I am as like to call thee so again, to spit on thee again, to spurn thee too. If thou would lend this money, lend it not as to thy friends, for when did friendship take a breed for barren metal of his friend? But lend it rather to thine enemy, who if he break, thou mayest with better face exact the penalty. Why, look! You, how you storm! 
I would be friends with you and have your love. Forget the shames that you have stained me with. Supply your present wants and take no doit of usances for my monies. And you'll not hear me. <laughs> this is kind I offer. This were kindness. This kindness I will show. Go with me to a notary. Seal me there your single bond and... In a merry sport, if you repay me not on such a day, in such a place, such sum or, or sums as are expressed in the condition, let the forfeit be nominated for an equal pound of your fair flesh, to be cut off and taken in what part of your body pleases me. Content, in faith, I'll seal to such a bond and say there is much kindness in the Jew. You shall not seal to such a bond for me. I'll rather dwell in my necessity. I uh, fear not, man. I will not forfeit it. Within these two months, that's a month before this bond expires, I do expect return of thrice three times the value of this bond. Oh, Father Abraham, what these Christians are, whose own hard dealings teaches them suspect the thoughts of others. Pray you tell me this. If he should break his day, what should I gain by the exaction of the forfeiture? A pound of a man flesh taken from a man is not so estimable, profitable neither as flesh of muttons, beef, or goats. I say, to buy his favour, I extend this friendship. If he will take it so, if not, adieu. And for my love, I pray you wrong me not. Yes, Shylock, I will seal unto this bond. Then meet me forthwith at the notary's. Give him direction for this merry bond, and I will go and purse the ducat straight. See to my house left in the fearful guard of an unthrifty knave, and presently I'll be with you. Hi thee, gentle Jew. The Hebrew will turn Christian. He grows kind. I like not fair terms in a villain's mind. Come on, in this there can be no dismay. My ships come home a month before the day. Act two, scene one. Belmont. Enter the Prince of Morocco with Portia, Nerissa, and their train. Mislike me not for my complexion, the shadowed livery of the burnished sun, to whom I am a neighbor and near bred. Bring me the fairest creature northward born, where Phoebus's fire scarce thaws the icicles. And let us make incision for your love, to prove whose blood is reddest, his or mine. I tell thee, lady, this aspect of mine hath feared the valiant. By my love, I swear, the best regarded virgins of our clime have loved it too. I would not change this hue except to steal your thoughts my gentle queen. In terms of choice, I am not solely led by nice direction of a maiden's eyes. Besides, the lottery of my destiny bear bars me the right of voluntary choosing. But if my father had not scanted me and hedged me by his wit to yield myself, his wife who wins me by my means, I told you, your self-renowned prince then stood as fair as any corner I have looked on yet for my affection. Even for that, I thank you. Therefore, I pray you lead me to the caskets to try my fortune by the scimitar that slew the Sophiana Persian prince that won three fields of Sultan Soliman. I would stare the sternest eyes that look I'll brave the heart most daring on the earth, pluck the young sucking cubs from the she-bear. Yea, mock the lion when he roars for prey to win thee, lady. But alas, the while, if Hercules and Lycus play a dice, which is the better man, the greater throw, may turn my fortune from weaker hand so is Alcides beaten by his page. And so may I, blind fortune leading me, miss that which one unworthier may attain. 
and die with grieving. You must take your chance and either not attempt to choose at all or swear before you choose. If you choose wrong, never to speak to lady afterward in way of marriage, therefore be advised. Nor will not, come, bring me unto my chance. First forward to the temple. After dinner, your hazard shall be made. Good fortune then, to make me blessed or cursed among men. Act two, scene two, a street in Venice. Enter Lancelot Gobble, the clown. Certainly my conscience will serve me to run from this Jew, my master. The fiend is at mine elbow and tempts me, saying to me, Gobbo, or Lancelot Gobbo, or, or good Lancelot, or good Gobbo, or good Lancelot Gobbo. Use your legs, take the start, run away. My conscience says, no, take heed, honest Lancelot, take heed, honest Gobbo, or as aforesaid, honest Lancelot Gobbo, do not run, scorn running with thy heels. While the more courageous fiend bids me pack. Fia, says the fiend, away, says the fiend. Rouse up a brave mind, says the fiend, and run. While my conscience, hanging about the neck of my heart, says very wisely to me, my honest friend Lancelot, being an honest man's son, or rather an honest woman's son, for indeed my father did something smack, something grow too. He had a kind of taste. Well, my conscience says, Lancelot, budge not. Budge, says the fiend. Budge not, says my conscience. Conscience, say I, you counsel well. Fiend, say I, you counsel well. To be ruled by my conscience, I should stay with the Jew, my master, who, God was the mark, is a kind of devil. And to run away from the Jew, I should be ruled by the fiend, who, saving your reverence, is the devil himself. Certainly, the Jew is the very devil incarnation, and in my conscience, my conscience is but a kind of hard conscience to offer to counsel me to stay with the Jew. The fiend gives the more friendly counsel, I will run. Fiend, my heels are at your command. I will run. Uh, uh, master, young man, you, uh, I pray you, which is the way to master Jews? Oh, heavens, this is my true begotten father, who, being more than sand blind, high gravel blind, knows me not. I will try confusions with him. Uh, oh, ma master, young gentleman, I pray you, which is the way to master Jews? Oh. Turn up on your right hand at the next turning, but at the next turning of all on your left, marry at the very next turning, turn of no hand, but turn down indirectly to the Jew's house. Oh, by God's sonities, it will be a hard way to hit. Uh, uh, can you tell me whether one Lancelot that dwells with him, uh, dwell with him or no? Uh, talk you of young Master Lancelot. <laughs> Mark me now, now will I raise the waters. Uh, talk you of young Master Lancelot. <clears throat> Uh, uh, no master, sir, but a, a poor man's son. Uh, uh, his father, though I say it, is an honest, exceeding poor man, and God be thanked well to live. Well, let his father be what he will. We, we talk of young master Lancelot. Uh, your worship's friend and Lancelot, sir. <laughs> but I pray you, ere go, old man, ere go. Talk you of, old, of young master Lancelot. Uh, of Lancelot? I, please your mastership. Ergo, Master Lancelot! Talk not of Master Lancelot. Father, for the young gentleman, according to fates and destinies and such odd sayings, the sisters three and such branches of learning is indeed deceased, or as you would say in plain terms, gone to heaven. Oh, Mary, God forbid. The boy was the very staff of my age, my very prop. Do I look like a cudgel or a hobbin post or a staff or a prop? <laughs> Do you know me, father? Uh, lack the day, I know you not, uh, young gentleman. Uh, but uh, I pray you tell me, is my boy, God rest his soul, alive or dead? Do you not know me, father? Uh, uh, lack, sir, I am sand blind. I, I know you not. Nay, indeed, if you had your eyes, you might fail of the knowing of me. It is a wise father that knows his own child. 
Well, old man, I will tell you news of your son. Give me your blessing. Truth will come to light. Murder cannot be hid long. A man's son may, but in the end, truth will out. Uh, no, I pray you, sir, stand up, stand up. I, I am sure you are not Lancelot, my boy. Pray you, let's have no more fooling about it, but give me your blessing. I am Lancelot, your, your boy that was, your son that is, and your child that shall be. I cannot think you are my son. I know not what I shall think of that. Uh, but I am Lancelot, the Jew's man, and I am sure Marjorie, your wife, is my mother. Oh, her name is Marjorie indeed. <laughs> I'll, I'll be sworn. If thou be Lancelot, thou art mine own flesh and blood. <laughs> God, worship might he be. No. <laughs> Oh, what a beard thou hast. <laughs> thou hast got more hair on thy chin than Dobbin, my fill horse, has on his tail. <laughs> it should seem, then, that Dobbin's tail grows backward. I am sure he had more hair on his tail than I have on my face when I last saw him. Oh, and, Lord, how art thou changed? <laughs> how, how dost thou mast and thy master agree? I, I have brought him a present. How, how agree you now? Well... Well, but for mine own part, as I have set up my rest to run away, so I will not rest till I have run some ground. My master's a very Jew. Give him a present, give him a halter. I am famished in his service. You may tell every finger I have with my ribs. Father, I am glad you are come. Give me your present to one Master Bassanio, who indeed gives rare new liveries. If I serve not him, I will run as far as God has any ground. Oh, rare fortune. Here comes the man. To him, father, for I am a Jew if I serve the Jew any longer. You may do so, but let it be so hasted that supper be ready at the farthest by five of the clock. See these letters delivered, the deliveries to making, and desire Graciano to come anon to my lodging. To him, father. Uh, um, uh, God bless your worship. Gramercy, wouldst thou off with me? Uh, here's my son, sir, a, uh, a poor boy. <laughs> and not a poor boy, sir, but the, the rich Jew's man that would, sir, as my father shall specify. Uh, he hath a great infection, sir, as one would say, to serve. Indeed, the, the short and the long is, I serve the Jew, and I have a desire, as my father shall specify. Uh, his master and he, saving your worship's reverence, are are. Scarce cater cousins, I am. To be brief, the very truth is that the Jew, having done me wrong, doth cause me, as my father being, I hope, an old man, shall fruitify unto you. I, I have here a dish of doves that I would bestow upon your worship, and, and my, my suit is... In very brief, the suit is impertinent to myself, as your worship shall know by this honest old man, and though I say it, though old man, yet poor man, my father... One, speak for both. What would you? Serve you, sir. That is the very defect of the matter, sir. I know thee well. Thou hast obtained thy suit. Shylock, thy master, spoke with me this day, and hath preferred thee, if it be preferment to have a rich Jew's service, to become the follower of so poor a gentleman. The old proverb is very well parted between my master Shylock and you, sir. Uh, you have the grace of God, sir, and he hath enough. Thou speaks it well. Go, father, with thy son. Take leave of thy old master and inquire my lodging out. Give him a livery more guarded than his fellows. See it done. Uh, father, in. I cannot get service, no. I have ne'er a tongue in my head. Well, uh, if any man in Italy have a fairer table which doth offer to swear upon a book, I shall have good fortune. Go to. Uh, here's a simple line of life. Here's a a small trifle of wives, oh, alas, 15 wives is nothing, 11 widows, and 9 maids is a simple coming to for one man, and then to escape drowning thrice, and to be in peril of my life within the edge of a feather bed, oh, here are simple scapes. Well, if fortune be a woman, she's a good wench for this gear. Uh, father, come, I'll take my leave of the Jew in the twinkling. I pray thee, good Leonardo, think on this. These things being bought and orderly bestowed, return in haste, for I do feast tonight, my best esteemed acquaintance. Heidi, go. My best endeavor shall be done herein. Ah, where's your master? Yep, yonder, sir, he walks. Uh, Signor Bassanio. Ah, Graziano. I have suit to you. You have obtained it. 
And you must not deny me. I must go with you to Belmont. Why, then you must. But hear thee, Graziano. Thou art too wild, too rude and bold of voice, parts that become thee happily enough, and in such eyes as ours appear not false. But where thou, but where thou art not known, where, why, there they show something too liberal. Pray thee, take pain to allay with some cold drops of modesty thy skipping spirit, lest through thy wild behavior I be misconstrued in the place I go to and lose my hopes. Senor Pisanio, hear me. If I do not put on a sober habit, talk with respect, and swear, but uh, now and then, uh, wear prayer books in my pocket, look demurely, oh, nay more, while Grace is saying, hood my eyes, thus with my hat, and say and sigh, amen, and use all observance of civility, like one studied in a sad ostent to please his granddam, never trust me more. Well, we shall see your bearing. Uh, nay, but I bar tonight. Uh, you shall not gauge me by what we do tonight. <laughs> no, that were a pity. I would entreat you rather to put on your boldest suit of mirth, for we have friends that purpose merriment. But fare you well. I have some business. And I must to Lorenzo and the rest. But we will visit you at supper time. <laughs> Act 2, Scene 3. Shylock's house in Venice. Enter Jessica and Lancelot Goble. I'm sorry thou wilt leave my father so. Our house is hell, and thou, a merry devil, didst rob it of some taste of tediousness. But fare thee well. There's a ducat for thee. And Lancelot, soon at supper shall thou see Lorenzo, who's thy new master's guest. Give him this letter. Do it secretly. And so farewell. I would not have my father see me and talk with thee. Adieu. Tears exhibit my tongue, most beautiful pagan, most sweet Jew. If a Christian do not play the knave and get thee, I am much deceived. But adieu. These foolish drops do something drown my manly spirit. Adieu. Farewell, good Lancelot. Alack, what heinous sin is it in me to be ashamed to be my father's child? But though I am a daughter to his blood, I am not to his manners. Oh, Lorenzo. If thou keep promise, I shall end this strife, become a Christian, and thy loving wife. Act 2, Scene 4. Enter Graziano, Lorenzo, Salarino, and Solanio. Nay, we will slink away in supper time, disguise us at my lodging, and return all in an hour. We have not made good preparation. We have not spoke us yet of torch-bearers. Tis vile, unless it may be quaintly ordered, and better in my mind not undertook. Tis now but four o'clock. We have two hours to furnish us. Friend Lancelot, what's the news? And it shall please you to break this up. Uh, it shall seem to signify. I know the hand in faith, tis a fair hand. And whiter than the paper it writ on is the fair hand that writ. Good love news of faith. By your leave, sir. Whither goest thou? Mary, sir, to bid my old master the Jew to sup tonight with my new master the Christian. Here. Hold here, take this. Tell gentle Jessica I will not fail her. Speak it privately. Go, gentlemen. Will you prepare you for this mass tonight? I am provided a torchbearer. I, Mary, I'll be gone about it straight. And so will I. Meet me and Graciano at Graciano's lodging some hour hence. Tis good we do so. Was not that letter from fair Jessica? <laughs> I must needs tell thee all. She hath directed how I shall take her from her father's house, what gold and jewels she is furnished with, what pages suit she hath in readiness. If ere the Jew her father come to heaven, it will be for his gentle daughter's sake. 
and never dare misfortune cross her foot unless she do it under this excuse that she is issued to a faithless Jew. Come, go with me. Peruse this as thou goest. <laughs> that Jessica shall be my torchbearer. <laughs> Act two, scene five. Shylock's house. Enter Shylock and Lancelot, his man that was. Well, thou shalt see. Thy eyes shall be thy judge, the difference of old Shylock and Bassanio. <laughs> what, Jessica? Thou shalt not gormandize as thou hast done with me. What, Jessica? And sleep and snore and rend apparel out. Why, Jessica, I say? Why, Jessica? Who bids thee call? I did not bid thee call. Your worship was wont to tell me I could do nothing without bidding. All you, what is your will? I am bid forth to supper, Jessica. There are my keys. But wherefore should I go? I am not bid for love. They flatter me. But yet I'll go in hate to feed upon the prodigal Christian. Jessica, my girl, look to my house. I am right loath to go out. There is some ill a-brewing towards my rest, for I did dream of money bags tonight. I beseech you, sir, go. My young master doth expect your reproach. So do I his. And they have conspired together. I, I will not say you shall see a mask, but if you do, then it was not for nothing that my nose fell bleeding on Black Monday last at six o'clock in the morning. Falling out that year on Ash Wednesday was four year in the afternoon. What are their masks? Hear you me, Jessica. Lock up my doors, and when you hear the drum and vile squealing of the wry necked fife, clamber not you up to the casements then, nor thrust your head into the public street to gaze on Christian fools with varnished faces, but stop my house's ears, I mean my casements. Let not the sound of shallow foppery enter my sober house. By Jacob's staff, I swear I have no mind of feasting forth tonight, but I will go. Go you before me, sirrah. Say I will come. I will go before, sir. Mistress, look out at the window for all this. There will come a Christian by will be worth a Jewess eye. What says that fool of Hagar's offspring, huh? His words were farewell, mistress, nothing else. The patch is kind enough, but a huge feeder. Snail slow in profit, and he sleeps by day more than the wildcat. Drones hive not with me. Therefore I part with him, and part with him to one that I would have him help to waste his borrowed purse. Well, Jessica, go in. Perhaps I will return immediately. Do as I bid you. Shut doors after you. Fast bind, fast find. A proverb never stale in thrifty mind. Farewell, and if my fortune be not crossed, I have a father, you a daughter, lost. Act two, scene six. A street in Venice. Enter the maskers, Graziano and Salarino. This is the penthouse under which Lorenzo desired us to make stand. His hour is almost past. And it is marvel he outdwells his hour, for lovers ever run before the clock. Oh, ten times faster Venus's pigeons fly to seal love's bonds new made than they are wont to keep obliged faith unforfeited. <laughs> that ever holds. Who riseth from a feast with that keen appetite that he sits down? Where is the horse that doth untread again his tedious measures with the abated fire, that he did pace them first? <laughs> All things that are are with more spirit chased than enjoyed. <laughs> How like a younger or a prodigal the scarf and bark puts forth from her native bay, hugged and embraced by the strumpet wind. How like the prodigal doth she return, with o'er-weathered ribs and ragged sails, lean, rent, and beggared by the strumpet wind. Sweet friends, your patience for my long abode. Not I, but my affairs have made you wait. When you shall please to play the thieves for wives, I'll watch as long for you then. Approach, here dwells my father Jew. Oh, who's within? Who are you? Tell me for more certainty, albeit I'll swear that I do know your tongue. 
Lorenzo and thy love. Lorenzo, certain, and my love, indeed. For who love I so much? And now who knows but you, Lorenzo, whether I am yours? Heaven and thy thoughts are witness that thou art. Here, catch this casket. Oh, it is worth the pains. I am glad tis night you do not look on me, for I am much ashamed of my exchange. But love is blind, and lovers cannot see the pretty follies that themselves commit. For if they could, Cupid himself would blush to see me thus transformed to a boy. <laughs> Descend, for you must be my torchbearer. What, must I hold the candle to my shames? They in themselves, good sooth, are too, too light. Why, tis an office of discovery, love, and I should be obscured. So are you, sweet, even in the lovely garnish of a boy. But come at once, for the closed night doth play the runaway, and we are stayed for Bassanio's feast. I will make fast the doors and gild myself with some more ducats and be with you straight. Now, by my hood, a gentle and no Jew. Bestrew me, but I love her heartily, for she is wise, if I can judge of her. And fair she is, if that mine eyes be true, and true she is, as she hath proved herself. And therefore, like herself, wise, fair, and true, shall she be placed in my constant soul. What, art thou come? On, gentlemen, away! Our masking mates by this time for us stay. Who's there? Oh, Signor Antonio? Fie, fie, Graciano, where are all the rest? Tis nine o'clock, our friends all stay for you. No mask tonight, the wind has come about. Bassanio presently will go abroad. I have sent 20 out to seek for you. I'm glad on it. I desire no more delight than to be under sail and gone tonight. Act two, scene seven. Belmont. Enter Portia with the Prince of Morocco and both their trains. Go, draw aside the curtains and discover the several caskets to this noble prince. Now make your choice. Hmm. This first of gold, who this inscription bears, who chooseth me shall gain what many men desire. Hmm. The second, silver, which this promise carries, who chooseth me shall get as much as he deserves. The third, dull lead, with warning all its blunt, who chooses me must give and hazard all he hath. How shall I know if I do choose the right? One of them contains my picture, Prince. If you choose that, then I am yours withal. Some God direct my judgment. Let me see. I will survey at the inscriptions back again. What says this leaden casket? Who chooseth me must give and hazard all he hath? Must give for what? For lead? Hazard for lead? This casket threatens men that hazard all. Do it in hope of fair advantages. A golden mind stoops not to show of dross. I'll then nor give nor hazard aught for lead. Hmm. What says the silver with her virgin hue? Who chooseth me shall get as much as he deserves. Hmm. As much as he deserves. Pause there, Morocco, and weigh thy value with an even hand. If thou be straighted by thy estimation, thou dost deserve enough. And yet enough may not extend so far as to the lady. And yet to be afeard of my deserving were but a weak disabling of myself. As much as I deserve, why, 
that's the lady. I do in birth deserve her and in fortunes and graces and in qualities of breeding. But more than these, in love I do deserve. <laughs> what if I strayed no farther but chose her here? Let's see once more the same graved in gold. Hmm. Who chooseth me shall gain what many men desire. Why, that's the lady. All the world desires her. From the four corners of the earth they come to kiss this shrine, this mortal breathing saint, the Hyrcanian deserts and the vasty wilds of white Arabia are as thoroughfares now for princes to come to view fair Portia, the watery kingdom whose ambitious head spets in the face of heaven is no bar to stop the foreign spirits, but they come as a brook to see fair Portia. Hmm. One of these three contains her heavenly picture. Is it like that lid contains her toward damnation? I to think so base a thought it were to gross to rib her cerecloth cloth in the obscure grave. Or shall I think in silver she's immured? Being ten times under valley to try gold? Oh, sinful thought, never so rich a gem. Was set in worse than gold. They have in England a coin that bears the figure of an angel stamped in gold, but that's in sculpt upon. But here, an angel in golden bed lies all within. Deliver me the key. Here do I choose and thrive I as I may. There, take it, Prince. And if my form lie there, then I am yours. No, hell, what have we here? Carrion death within whose empty eye, there is written a scroll. I'll read the writing. All the glisters is not gold. Often have you heard that told. Many a man his life has sold but my outside to behold. Gilded tombs do worms enfold. Had you been as wise as bold, young in limbs, in judgment old, your answer had not been enscrolled. Fare you well, your suit is cold. Cold indeed and labor lost. Then farewell heat and welcome frost. Portia, adieu, I too have grieved a heart to take a tedious leave, thus losers part. A gentle riddance, for all the curtains go, let all of his complexion choose me so. Act two, scene eight, a street in Venice. Enter Salarino and Solanio. Why, man, I saw Bassanio under sail. With him is Graciano gone along, and in their ship, I am sure, Lorenzo is not. The villain Jew with outcries raised the duke, who went with him to search Bassanio's ship. He came too late. The ship was under sail. 
Uh, but there the Duke was given to understand that in a gondola were seen together Lorenzo and his amorous Jessica. Besides, Antonio certified the Duke. They were not with Bassanio in his ship. I never heard a passion so confused, so strange, outrageous, and so variable as the dog Jew did utter in the streets. My daughter, oh, my ducats, oh, my daughter, fled with a Christian, oh, my Christian ducats, justice, the law, my ducats, and my daughter, a sealed bag, two sealed bags of ducats, of double ducats, stolen from me by my daughter, and jewels, two stones, two rich and precious stones, stolen by my daughter, justice, find the girl, she has the stones of Potter and the ducats. Now why all the boys in Venice follow him, crying his stones, his daughter, and his ducats. Let good Antonio look he keep his day, or he shall pay for this. Mm, Mary, well remembered. I reasoned with a Frenchman yesterday who told me in the narrow seas that part, the French and English, there miscarried a vessel of our country richly fraught. I thought upon Antonio when he told me, and wished in silence that it were not his. You were best to tell Antonio what you hear, yet... Do not suddenly, for it may grieve him. Mm, a kinder gentleman treads not the earth. I saw Bassanio and Antonio part. Bassanio told him he would make some speed of his return. He answered, do not so. Slubber not business for my sake, Bassanio, but stay the very riping of the time. And for the Jew's bond, which he hath of me, let it not enter in your mind of love, be merry and employ the chiefest thoughts to courtship and to fair ostents of love as shall conveniently become you there. And even there, his eyes being big with tears, turning his face, he put his hand behind him and with affection wondrous sensible, he wrung Bassanio's hand. And so they parted. I think he only loves the world for him. I pray thee, let us go and find him out, and quickens his embraced heaviness with some delight or other. No, oh, do we so? Act two, scene nine. Belmont. Enter Nerissa and a servitor. Quick, quick, I pray thee, draw the curtain straight. The prince of Aragon hath ta'en his oath and comes to his election presently. Behold, there stand the caskets, noble prince. If you choose that wherein I am contained, straight shall our nuptial rites be solemnized. But if you fail without more speech, my lord, you must be gone from hence immediately. I am enjoined by oath to observe three things. First, never to unfold to anyone which casket twas I chose. Next, if I fail of the right casket, never in my life to woo a maid in way of marriage. Lastly, if I do fail in fortune of my choice, immediately to leave you and be gone. With these injunctions, every one doth swear that comes to hazard for my worthless self. And so I have addressed me, fortune now to my heart's hope. Ah, gold, silver, and base lead, <laughs> who chooseth me must give and hazard all he hath. You shall look fairer if I give or hazard. What says the gold chest here, let me see. Who chooseth me shall gain what many men desire. Oh, what many men desire, that many may be meant by the full multitude that choose by show not learning more than the fond eye doth teach, which prize not to the interior, but like the marlet builds in the weather on the outward wall, even in the force and road of casualty. <laughs> I will not choose what many men desire, <laughs> because I will not jump with common spirits and rank me with the barbarous multitudes. <laughs> Why then to thee, thou silver treasure house, tell me once more what title thou dost bear. Who chooseth me shall get as much as he deserves. And well said, too, for who shall go about to cousin fortune and be 
honorable without the stamp of merit, let alone presume to wear an undeserved dignity. Oh, that estates, degrees, and offices were not derived corruptly, and that clear honor were purchased by the merit of the wearer. How many then should cover that stand bare? How many be commanded that command? How much low peasantry would then be gleaned from the true seed of honor? And how much honor picked from the chafe and ruin of the times to be new burnished? Well, but to my choice, who chooseth me shall get as much as he deserves. I shall assume desert. Give me the key for this. And instantly unlock my fortunes here. <laughs> Too long a pause for that which you find there. What's here? Uh, the portrait of a blinking idiot presenting me a schedule. <laughs> I will read it. How much unlike thou art to Portia? How much unlike my hopes and my deservings? Who chooseth me shall have as much as he deserves. Did I not deserve more than a fool's head? Is that my prize and my deserts no better? To offend and judge are distinct offices and of opposed natures. What is here? The fire seven times tried this, seven times tried that judgment is, that did never choose amiss. Some there be that shadows kiss, such have but a shadow's bliss. There be fools alive, it was, silvered o'er, and so was this. Take what wife you will to bed, I will ever be your head. Begone, you are sped. Still more fool I shall appear by the time I linger here. With one fool's head I came to woo, and I go ahead with two. Sweet ado, I'll keep my oath patiently to bear my roast. Thus hath the candle singed the moth. Oh, these deliberate fools, when they do choose, they have the wisdom by their wit to lose. The ancient saying is no heresy. Hanging and wiving goes by destiny. Come, draw the curtain, Ursa. Where is my lady? Here, what would my lord? Madam, there is a lighted at your gate, a young Venetian, one that comes before to signify the approaching of his lord, from whom he bringeth a sensible regret, uh, to wit, besides commands and courteous breath, gifts of rich value, yet I have not seen so likely an ambassador of love. A day in April never came so sweet to show how costly summer was at hand, as this forespur comes before his lord. No more, I pray thee, I am half afeard that will say anon he is some kin to thee. Thou spendest such high day wit in praising him. Come, come, Nerissa, for I long to see. Quick Cupid's post that comes so mannerly. Bassanio, Lord love, if thy will it be. <sighs> mm -hmm.